Sean Hook's Newsmaker Saturday starts now. Thanks for joining us on Newsmaker Saturday. It has been a great winter in the West, in the Mountain West. And that will certainly help with the water situation in Arizona. But the shrinking Colorado River that feeds the Central Arizona Project is still pushing out more water than it's taking in. This week, six western states, including Arizona, agreed to make big cuts moving forward to try to protect that Colorado River. But California is holding out, and it's the biggest user. They're saying that they will not starve their farmers, who represent the breadbasket of the United States out there in the Imperial Valley. So now what is the question? Sarah Porter is the director of the Kyle Center for Water Policy at Arizona State University. She joins us. Sarah, thank you again. You've been a tremendous resource for us. I'm happy to be here. Sarah, why does California hold all the cards, it seems, in this water fight? California has some big users with very senior water rights. The biggest single rights holder to Colorado River water is the Imperial Irrigation District. Um, and they have a uh, very, very senior water right. So you have this combination of a uh, very senior water rights holder, which means that in the time of cuts, they would be the last to experience cuts, and it's a lot of water. I don't know the history. I know some of the history, but we, we must have mm -hmm. leaned on California hard back in the day to get um, congressmen to pass this whole we project, we which did. was massive. We, Arizona actually took California to the U.S. Supreme Court to fight for Arizona's Colorado River right. And actually, by all you know, lights, won that uh, dispute. But a few years later, when Arizona needed the congressional delegation of California to vote to approve the development of the Central Arizona Project Canal, which moves a large amount of Colorado River water to the Phoenix to Tucson areas. Um, the, the California de delegation insisted that Central Arizona take junior priority, meaning that if there were a time of shortage, the cuts would fall to the users in Central Arizona first. So interesting. And that's why we're in this situation. Yeah, it's so interesting because at that point we probably said, oh, well, I mean, we're growing, but we're not going to grow that much. So, <laughs> you know, it probably seemed like a good I, deal at the time. I, I think they had us over a barrel. Um, Arizona desperately needed that water because at that time, Central Arizona was overdrafting our aquifers by a, a significant amount every single year. And Groundwater, so you're talking bringing about. in the big Colorado River supply was very important to help solve our problem of groundwater yeah. overdrafting. Okay, so um, the six states say, okay, we're going to make cuts. California, you're going to have to make some cuts to your ag. Mm -hmm. we, we seem to be in this weird spot right now. We, we just had Mexico say, no dice on the desal plant down there. They, they, the governor of Sonora said, look, you know, you're not going to leave yeah. us with all of this waste, the brine, all the stuff we've talked about that comes from desal. And so it looks like we're in a position where conservation may be our only option in the near future. Am I reading that wrong? You are correctly reading that conservation is the best option. It's always the cheapest option, and we have total control over it. So conservation is the first thing we should do when we're trying to make sure we have enough water to meet demand. But it's not the only option. There are several concepts out there that are being worked on for new water supplies. Uh, one is to take water from a basin, a groundwater basin that's next door to, Mar that it's in western Maricopa County, um, and pipe it or put it in the CAP canal and move it to the valley. Um, there, there are options that a group of cities and SRP are looking at to enlarge one of the dams on the Verde River, which would mean a bigger water supply from the Verde River that could be available to users in the valley. And apart from that, it's really important for people to understand that cities actually use a fairly modest amount of the Colorado River water that the CAP delivers. So the cities that have rights to Colorado River water can sustain cuts without significant disruption to the city's 
uh, water supplies that they need to deliver to people's taps. That's so important because people, I think, don't realize that agriculture yeah. uses a lion's share. About 80% of our water goes to agriculture. Right on. That's exactly right. And so we got to figure you know, out is, how to do that more efficiently. It strikes it, me. It's very hard. It, you know, we're really, the ag users in Arizona have invested for years in becoming more efficient. In Yuma County, Arizona, the southwestern Arizona, they are really proud, and we should, as Arizonans, we should all be proud of how efficient uh, they are in their use of water to grow uh, winter vegetables for the entire nation. We're really at a point now where there aren't a lot of wins in terms of efficiency. We can't get to where we need to be in the Colorado just by making water users more efficient. We have to have significant cuts in the amount of water people are taking out of the Colorado River. And that's why this is so very, very difficult. Okay, now correct me if I'm wrong. I understand that this delegation went over to Israel to talk to them about desal and what they're doing over there. And my understanding of this discussion this was congressman i think um i think mark kelly was part of this whole delegation went over there I, I am told that israel said okay you guys keep talking about desal how are you irrigating your crops in arizona and the answer was flood irrigation flooding the field and the and the guys from israel said why are you here you need to solve that first before you even need to bother looking at desal. Is that about what happened? I've heard of that conversation too, and I think that probably was the conversation, and I doubt they had a farmer in the room when that conversation went down, because a farmer would have explained that not everything can be grown through the drip irrigation that Israel uses to grow tomatoes and vegetables. Um, the, the, the flood irrigation that's being deployed in Yuma is incredibly efficient. The amount of efficiencies that you could gain through other technologies may not be that great. Um, and also, you may not be able to grow the things that we all depend on as a nation. You know, corn, wheat, cotton, lettuce, other winter vegetables, not uh, some of those can be grown with with more efficient technologies like drip but the cost of those pro um, crops goes way way up when you use drip and some of them can't be grown okay. uh, using drip so it's just it's this is all not so simple no i know and and i'm detecting correct me if i'm wrong i'm detecting in you a little bit of protection for the farmers that you don't want to throw the farmers under the bus even though they're using 80 percent you're like hey wait a minute we need to tread lightly here because this is very important for our economy for their survival let's not get crazy about kind of demonizing farmers you're right on nobody's the bad guy here no the farmers aren't responsible for the for the shortage on the colorado river and the farmers are there using the water in the way that they've been encouraged to by the government, by the consumers, you know, by all of our policies for years and years and years. So while to my mind, it's impossible to envision how we can save the Colorado system without the participation of agriculture, which means cuts to water for agriculture, um, it's, it isn't, they don't deserve to be cut. The cuts shouldn't happen because they're not being efficient. Um, unfortunately, there's really not another way to get there without farmers taking less water. Cities also need to take less water. We all need to pitch in here. Okay, let me quote uh, Rhett Larson. You must know him, mm -hmm. professor of water law at ASU. Yeah. He was quoted this week saying the strongest thing that the other basin states have going for them is some relative level of consensus. He's speaking about the six states this is, we, you can tick them off for us, but it's Arizona and Utah and Colorado. All of these states have agreed to make cuts. He said, the strongest thing California has going for it is the law. <laughs> well, I think that that's a good point. Um, Arizona also has real challenges getting consensus among the water users. And so uh, I, I might uh, disagree with, with Professor Larson about the degree to which we have consensus between main stem agricultural users and cities in central Arizona 
and another important uh, group of users is tribes. They all have different needs and different perspectives. But he's he's right that California has this position of, of um, very senior, in other words, high priority rights, uh, last to take a cut under a strict interpretation of the law and the largest allocation of Colorado River. Have we overplayed our hand with reliance on CAP? In other words, we, it was so good for so long that we may have kind of had a blind spot and not planned accordingly? You know, that's one place where we have done it right. Cities, ne we never, as a state, as a region, we never grew into our CAP supplies. And so we were taking extra Colorado River water and banking it in aquifers. Uh, we were, we have a hundred year water supply um, requirements for new development. And it has been a long time since new development has looked to the CAP as the water supply for growth. Uh, so we've been fortunate in being very careful about the extent to which we become rel reliant on CAP supplies. That doesn't mean that we don't have any reliance. It doesn't mean that the cuts are easy or painless, but it could be so much worse. If we had built out municipal demand for the whole 1.5 million acre feet of water that CAP delivers, we would be in a world of hurt. But in reality, the municipal demand for the amount of water that CAP can deliver in a non-shortage year is about a third of that total amount. If we were to say, uh, we're 22 years into a drought here, mm -hmm. if that were to end, let's say we got into a wet period and we go through 30 year cycles like this, could we kind of dodge this? I mean, I, I know that's wishful thinking, but that's possible, right? It's possible that we could have incredibly good snow year after year and the, it's, it's very unlikely, but it's possible that the reservoirs could stabilize, but it wouldn't solve the problem because an, while, you know, hotter, drier conditions, the longest drought in 1200 years are drivers of the problems we're having now. So is the fact that the reservoirs were over allocated from the get go. And so a, a big problem is that the enormous amount of water that evaporates off Lake Mead and the water that's lost when you move water through a system like that is not accounted for. And we would have to take care of that problem to really get out of trouble in the, in the Colorado River. It's fascinating. Sarah Porter, director of Kyle Center for uh, Water Policy at Arizona State University. If you see Senator Kyle, tell him hi for me. And we always wow. appreciate your, your input. Thank you. Sarah, great stuff. It's been good to talk with you. Thank you, John. Thanks. When we come back, we're going to talk fentanyl. It's a scourge. We're going to talk to poison control. There's a new fentanyl on the street, even more dangerous. Back in a minute. Welcome back to Newsmaker Saturday. We know well the scourge of fentanyl on our streets. We report on it virtually every night. It's the number one cause of death among U.S. adults ages 18 to 45. More adults between 18 and 45 died of fentanyl overdoses in 2020 than COVID-19, motor vehicle accidents, cancer, and suicide. The CDC now says over 100,000 Americans are dying of drug overdoses every year, many of them from fentanyl, which is 50 times stronger than heroin, 100 times stronger than morphine. Joining me now is Dr. Daniel Brooks, from the Banner Poison Control Center. Doctor, thank you so much. You're a toxicologist, uh, and I appreciate your time. This is an important subject. Thank you very much. It's a privilege. What are you seeing right now? I mean, we, we're reporting on it constantly. What are you seeing? The same. For the past uh, three or four years, our poison center, like the 54 other certified poison centers across America, have seen a great increase in the number of uh, poisoning-related deaths, specifically opiates and specifically fentanyl. Fentanyl is what? If you were to describe it to a stranger who said, what is this stuff? What would, how, how would you describe it? Well, in layman's terms, it's a very effective but potent uh, analgesic or pain medicine. It's synthetic, so it's, it's, an, it's a man-made form of a naturally occurring plant alkaloid like heroin. 
But in overdose and when it's made and produced illicitly, like we're looking at now, it, the dose is unknown. And some of these pills can have 10 or 50 doses within one pill. And when people use these um, pills or smoke them or snort them or, or ingest them, they have no idea how much they're getting and, and often become unconscious and stop breathing. And without immediate help, they'll die. So basically, we're looking at a quality control issue because this stuff is made in a rogue fashion. It's not made in a, you know, it's not Abbott Labs doing it. It's somebody else doing it on the side in Mexico, usually. As I understand it, the ingredients come from China. Mexico puts it together and traffic, traffics it up here to the United States. So what you're saying is when you're making a batch, you might have one grain of fentanyl in it, and then in another, in another pill, you might have five grains, which would kill you, right? That's exactly right. It's the, it's the variation in the dose between these pills that is unknown. So even if someone goes out and unfortunately buys 10 or 20 of these illicit pills, they may get lucky and use one or two and be okay, but then they just take the wrong pill and it's got 50 or 100 times as much fentanyl, sometimes other drugs in it, and they go down immediately. So you are literally playing Russian roulette if you're taking this stuff. Yeah, it's incredibly dangerous to use any medication that's not FDA approved. And this includes other medications that you can buy in, in stores. But when there's no oversight, uh, checking that the products are in the pill that, that is supposed to be in the pill, nothing else, and at the right dose. Anytime you use these non-approved or non-regulated medications, it is very dangerous. Let's go back to the beginning. There was a, a Belgian chemist, I think, in the early 60s who came up with this. There was a, a medical use for this. It was very important and still is, right? We use it every day. Every day in the emergency department, I use it. Every day in the intensive care unit, I use it, as most physicians do. It's very, very effective and powerful and, and required drug. It, it saved a lot of pain and suffering for folks including those, you know, several years ago suffering with, with COVID, it, it helped relieve, uh, relieve a lot of pain and anxiety. But when it's used inappropriately, especially when the dose is unknown, then it becomes dangerous and deadly. When did you first start seeing fentanyl, um, illegal fentanyl, hit the scene? And I believe for us locally at the uh, Banner Poison Drug Information Center is around March of 2018. And Several of the first cases that were documented in the United States came right through our corridor here. Um, we had seen fentanyl used illicitly before, uh, but it was incredibly rare because you could only get it from hospital sources, which was difficult and incredibly expensive. So about March of 2018, when we had 16 or 17 cases over just a couple of months here in Maricopa County, um, we raised the alert and the CDC and, and Arizona and Maricopa County public health uh, officials got on it. Dr. Brooks, you no doubt are aware of what happened in Apache Junction over the weekend. We had a three-year-old boy get a hold of fentanyl. Um, and, and we don't know, I, I don't think we know yet, whether it was illegal or whether it was prescribed or what it was, but the toddler ingested at least a pill, uh, maybe more. And, I mean, the, the symptoms are just horrific. Uh, respiratory system shut down after issues of brain swelling and stroke sympt symptoms. And he was eventually put on life support before he died, a three-year-old boy. Yeah, it, it's very sad. Uh, like you mentioned, we have about five Arizonas dying from fentanyl or opiates uh, every day and it doesn't discriminate based on age or gender or race. Uh, we see it in three-year-olds and eight-year-olds and 65-year-olds. It's very, very sad. Then we have this week a police officer go down after rolling down, they rolled down the window of a suspect vehicle and he was overcome with what they believe was exposure to fentanyl. I don't know how it didn't kill the occupants inside the car, but they described a smoke coming out of the window when the window was rolled down and it knocked the officer down. They had to give him Narcan to bring him back. Yes, we've heard about that case through the Poison Center. I'm unaware of the specifics. I've personally looked at uh, many cases over the last 10 years of occupational exposures. This is what we would, we would uh, describe this as, where someone isn't ingesting or injecting fentanyl. I've never seen a case where someone's become overwhelmed from just inhaling smoke or touching the pill, which is a concern. 
it's really um, incredibly unlikely. But again, I don't know the specifics of this case, so I can't comment on it. Well, the Narcan brought him back. So whatever they did, it, it, it must have had something to do with that. This is now not only in pill form, but people are smoking it. Are they using it in all kinds of different ways to get it into their system? Yes. Yes, they can take the pills and, and crush it up and either ingest them or snort them or smoke them. Okay, yeah. so this raises the specter that kids buying weed or even adults buying weed on the black market might be getting something they don't expect. We see contamination of illicit uh, drugs all the time. You're right. We, we see um, fentanyl has been added to many other drugs, illicit drugs that have been sold under different names. We've seen it, um, it being sold as... Uh, Alprazolam or Xanax. We've seen it sold even as methamphetamine, which is a stimulant, not an opiate. Um, I've not come across um, marijuana contaminated with fentanyl, but I'm sure it's there and I'm, I'm sure it's happened. Doctor, do, do you suspect that most of the people who end up, end up overdosing on fentanyl are people who got hooked on some type of prescription medication, then they were cut off, then they went on the street to try to get this high that they're now addicted to, and they end up buying stuff like fentanyl, and, and they don't know how much they're getting. Is it that, or is it people going out to get high and just get fentanyl? That's a good question, and it's a combination of both. You know, since about 2008, so, you know, not 2018, but 2008, uh, poison centers have noticed an increase in substance use disorder and in fatal and non-fatal overdoses. And we believe that the vast majority of substance use disorder, including opiates and fentanyl, uh, patients are treating undiagnosed or, or, or non-treated behavioral health issues, such as depression and anxiety. And we tend to see much more depression and anxiety in the world these days, unfortunately. And it, there's still a stigmatism with that. And there's still um, not a, a, enough resources to treat these folks. So many of them go out and, and self-medicate with medications, including illicit drugs. So years ago, there may have been some folks that uh, were using prescription opiates and then either couldn't get them anymore or found the illicit drugs cheaper. It's unclear to me. But uh, anecdotally, you know, where we take care of these patients ourselves at our admitting service here at Banner University Medical Center and at Phoenix Children's Hospital, at least in the last year, the majority of the patients we've cared for know they're going out and buying fentanyl by name. Wow. It's not surprising them. They're, they're going and getting it. Sometimes it's for pain, but often it's just to get high or, or to feel good. And w when we spend time interviewing these folks, we really help identify underlying um, behavioral health issues that, that need support and help. Boy, it is just scary stuff. I mean, we've had the talk with our kids who are teenagers, three of them, about, you know, if, if anybody's passing pills around at a party... <laughs> you know, you're, you're, looking, you're looking to kill yourself, in essence. We've had this talk with them. You know, you hate to have to do this, but parents should have that talk because this stuff is pervasive. Agreed, and, and congratulations. You're, you're exactly right. Many parents and caregivers are just embarrassed to talk about it or don't know where to start, but we all have to be talking about it, and not just our teenage kids, but even younger adolescents, as well as our colleagues, and cousins and, and parents, because again, we see lots of patients who don't realize how dangerous these medications are, including illicit fentanyl purchased on the street. We see people in their sixth and seventh decade of life using these drugs. Oh my goodness. Uh, Dr. Brooks, I really appreciate it. You've been a great guest and very, very helpful. We, we thank you for your time. Thank you for having me and thank you for uh, highlighting this very important issue. We'll do it again. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Daniel Brooks, toxicologist at Banner Poison and Drug Information. We're back in a minute on Newsmaker Saturday.